think about um, the generations and to say we want to make it a better place for our children and our children's children so that they, 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 they know it's a better world for them and think they can make it a better place. Mr. Ian Crane, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Okay, I, I probably should have um, called this talk tonight something like, is this for real? Because um, when I first started introducing this subject to people, the reaction was, oh, don't be so stupid, they're not going to do anything like that. And I said, well, you know, believe it or not, that's exactly what they want you to think. And I had one of these conversations, and the next day I was doing some research, and I pulled up a document from the National Health Federation. And you're going to hear about this organization during the course of my talk tonight. And the opening paragraph here, it says, Never heard of Codex? That's exactly what they want. The Codex Agenda. And we'll expand on this through the evening. The Codex Agenda. Only low-potency supplements available that will do nothing for your health. All or most foods genetically modified. And any beneficial supplements unavailable or sold only by prescription. Which is, by the way, exactly the way it is in Norway right now. And certain other countries are further down the road. But the key point here is, never heard of Codex? That's exactly what they want. So what I'm going to do tonight is basically put you on the spot. Because after tonight, you have to walk away from here and you have to make a decision. And that's a very, it's going to be a very fundamental decision. And when I show you what's coming, I think you'll understand why it's an important decision. But let me start by introducing you to um, this guy here, Mark Plotkin. I first came across this guy, or well, his books anyway, when I was doing some research in Central America about uh, 10 years ago. And I read a book of his called The Shaman's Apprentice. And Plotkin is a Harvard graduate, and he went on a trip, basically his first trip to the Amazon was just as a gopher. He just, wanted, he just fancied a, a break during his summer vacation, so he managed to finagle his way onto the trip as a, as a sort of bag carrier. But he was so fascinated by that trip that he decided that he actually wanted to change his course of study and actually study ethnobotany. So he went back into the Amazon a couple of years later, but this time on a different mission. And his mission was to go deep into the Amazon jungle and make contact with a tribe that had had almost no contact with, um, with the outside world. This took quite a while to set up, but he did this. And what he discovered there absolutely blew his mind. Because what he discovered was a culture that was really totally unspoiled by the Western world. Basically, the people uh, you know, basically ran around naked. I mean, the only foot dress was that the men had a little piece of string around their waist. And after a, a few days, he realized that the, this string actually had a purpose. Because when these guys were hunting in the jungle, they used this piece of string to tuck a certain appendage out of the way so they didn't catch when they were jumping over the, uh, the trees and the branches in the, in the forest. But that was it. But what fascinated him was their medicines. And the fact that the shaman, the medicine man, you know, basically was this repository of information that had been handed down generation after generation. And each shaman, as they reached a certain point in their life, would identify an apprentice within the tribe. And it would be the responsibility of the shaman to pass on that information and that knowledge to the apprentice. But Plotkin put the effort in to learn about the work of the shaman, and what he realized was that these guys had medicines, natural medicines, natural potions that they were mixing together, that basically cured their diseases and their illnesses, and they really you know, had a very long life expectancy. So he actually made notes of this and took that information back to um, LA, and to fund his trips to the Amazon, he sold that information that he had picked up to a pharmaceutical company. 
When he went back to the Amazon, he went back up to meet that same tribe four years later. And when he came up to the uh, um, landing stage on the, on the river, first of all, what shocked him was these guys came down to meet him in cut-off Levi's and Hawaiian shirts. Gone was the string around the waist. But then what he saw next threw him into a rage because he went into the shaman's hut and gone were you know, all the um, vases of the, the local herbs and the, the local plants for making the medicines and they were replaced with rows of bottles from the pharmaceutical companies. And when he looked closely he realised that some of these medicines were the synthetics that had been created from the information that he'd given the pharmaceutical company four year, or sold to the pharmaceutical company four years previously. And he asked the shaman why it was that they were using these medicines and he said, well the missionaries told us that to use our natural medicines is the work of the devil and that we have to use these bottled medicines. Well, I encourage you to read this book. It's still available, The Shaman's Apprentice. He actually goes very easy on the missionaries. I mean, one would expect, based on his experience, for him to be a little harsher. But he tries to go a little easy. The, the book, The Shaman's Apprentice, was actually turned into uh, a film as well, which is uh, also available on uh, DVD. But this is the quote that struck me. Every time a shaman dies, it's as if a library burned down. Well, being a student of um, the uh, traditions, ancient traditions, and the passage of ancient wisdom, of course, the realization, this isn't the first time that um, we've, been see we've seen this type of situation. I mean, the same people who were pushing the synthetic medicines on the tribes, you know, have the same belief system as those who burned down the Library of Alexandria in 415, who burned thousands upon thousands of books under the leadership of Bishop Diego de Landa in the 16th century in, um, in uh, Central America. And, and of course, actually, they're doing it right now in Baghdad with the destruction of the Baghdad uh, Museum and the special forces that are going out into uh, ancient Sumer and trying to hunt down any of the ancient texts, just in case there's anything there that contradicts their belief system they wished to put out to the masses. But Plotkin recognized that basically here we have a situation where knowledge that had been handed down for millennia was being wiped out in a heartbeat. The pharmaceutical industry fundamentally is about 80 years old. 80 years old. And then look, on the other side, this is a book that's just been published by um, uh, William Engdahl. It's called Seeds of Destruction, The Hidden Agenda of Genetic Manipulation. And I'm just going to read you a review. It is a review written by a friend of mine in Canada. Because this book is hot off the press, so I haven't read it myself. But uh, his review, he says, this skillfully researched book focuses on how a small socio-political American elite seeks to establish control over the very basics of human survival. The provision of our daily bread. Control the food and you control the people. This is no ordinary book about the perils of GMO. Engdahl takes the reader inside the corridors of power, into the back rooms of the science labs, behind closed doors in the corporate boardrooms. The author cogently reveals a diabolical world of profit-driven political intrigue, government corruption and coercion, where genetic manipulation and the patenting of life forms are used to gain worldwide control over food production. This is just the tip of the iceberg. 